Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken in Mandari. Se. Today's episode, we have the privilege of hosting Parakala Prabhakar, an esteemed Indian political economist, social commentator and former communications advisor in the Andhra Pradesh government. With a rich background in academia and extensive experience in the political arena, Mr. Parakala has played pivotal roles in various parties, including being a spokesperson for the BJP and a founding general secretary of the Praja Rajyam party. He brings a unique blend of insights and experiences coupled with his astute observations on current affairs, making him a notable figure in India's political discourse and an absolute pleasure for me to be talking to him today. So the first question, uh, Prabhakar, uh, that I would like to ask you is this, that you've had a diverse journey with the political uh, sphere, you know, being associated with multiple parties. How has this experience shaped your understanding of Indian politics and what motivated these shifts in your political affiliations over the years? Hmm. Interesting question, Mohua. Mohua, I was born into a Congress family. And uh, by the time I was born, my father was a very prominent congressman. He was a freedom fighter. My grandfather was also a freedom fighter and a, a very prominent Congress person in our uh, area. And uh, when I was a toddler, my father got elected to the Andhra Pradesh Legislative Assembly. And then, of course, he went on to be a uh, legislator for a long time. And then, of course, he was also a member of about uh, three or four uh, cabinets in Andhra Pradesh. And after my father, my mother also was uh, an MLA. And then I also, you know, uh, took an active part in uh, the politics uh, uh, after my return from uh, LSE. That was from 1991 onwards. And before I went to LSE, I was uh, very active in the student politics, uh, both at the university level as well as you know, in, the, in the state level uh, and in the national level too. Um, you see, my, my political uh, journey... Uh, you know, if you have had uh, your uh, parents and your grandparents uh, in politics and in political party, you not only inherit, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, their experience probably or uh, their connections and their uh, prestige and things like that, but you also inherit their animosities and enmities and, you know, his, they, their... Uh, uh, their adversaries become automatically your adversaries, although you don't choose and you have no quarrel with them. You see. Uh, and uh, I said this because, uh, you know, my father and uh, Mr. P. V. Narsimara were very close uh, friends for a long time. And, uh, you know, when uh, P. V. Narsimara demitted office as the Prime Minister, the Congress establishment uh, turned against him. You know all that. That's, that's the part of the history. Not only turned against him, but turned against all the people who were uh, associated with him. I was naturally associated with him because he was my father's friend. So we were all uh, marked people uh, in the Congress at that time. And, uh, you know, we had, we had to face a lot of trouble. And then we had to, you know... Uh, because you see, you are, once you are in the constituency level politics, uh, every village, every ward, every town, you know, you have your own people who supported your, you and uh, you traveled with you. Not only traveled with you, but they traveled with you in opposition to a lot of other people. So you had, uh, uh, you, you, you tend to feel an obligation to uh, be in the arena, to look after them, to be with them, to, you know, support them. Um, and uh, to have their back, you know, basically. So people like us, uh, when we were uh, persona non, non grata in the Congress party after Mr. Nassim Rao, we had to find some kind of a, you know, political platform. Uh, at that time, some of us uh, uh, went to the BJP um, in Andhra Pradesh. And Andhra Pradesh BJP was nothing actually. And today also it is nothing. There is no presence at all. Uh, we didn't go there in order to, you know, have any political mileage or, you know, political uh, 
positions, but you know, we just wanted to, you know, stay afloat in the political arena, the general political arena. Uh, but then when I saw the working, when I saw the, you know, the ideological drift that was taking place and, you know, which, which, which was, I was feeling very uncomfortable. The, so I, I, I came out and then uh, a few of us uh, got together and we thought that we should establish a political party in Andhra Pradesh. The reason being that, uh, you know, uh, the Andhra Pradesh electorate, when they were unhappy with Congress, they used to vote for uh, TDP, which is a regional party. And when they were unhappy with TDP, they used to go back to Congress. So it was alternating between TDP and uh, Congress for want of a proper alternative. So some of us thought that, you know, we should offer a proper constructive alternative to the people of Andhra Pradesh. So that, you know, instead of going, you know, like a ping pong ball from one party to the other, they can also have a, a choice. And that is when uh, some of us got together and we have uh, founded the Prajaraja Party. Although that came to be associated with a, with a, with a, a very charismatic uh, you know, cinema personality and all that. But, you know, um, uh, the, the documents that registered the party with the Election Commission of India uh, bear our signatures, some of our signatures. We were one of the found, some of the founders there. But then I quickly got disillusioned uh, with that uh, party because, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, evidence to me came to my notice that, you know, the then leadership uh, was selling tickets and taking bribes and, you know, all that kind of a thing. So I, much before the 2009 elections, I, I quit the party and I, I remain uh, um, unattached to any political party. Since then, it's, it's more than, uh, uh, you know, 15, 16 years now, uh, 15 years at least. Um, you know, th that that is my uh, travel with, you know, organized political parties. But I am, I am a political person. I have strong views about politics and I speak, I write. Um, and whoever cares to, you know, hear me out, you know, there, there, are, there are people who care to hear me out and ask me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I keep uh, giving my opinions out and write about, uh, you know, what's happening in India, etc. But I must tell you here uh, that, you know, uh, the political parties in India are supposed to be the vehicles of our democratic politics. Um, but you see, uh, very paradoxically, the political parties in India themselves are the most undemocratic outfits. They are either uh, pocket organizations of some uh, uh, very enterprising individuals or they are family organizations. You know, you look at from Jammu and Kashmir to, you know, UP, Bihar, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra, um, you know, the, the entire political geography of India, or Bengal for that matter, Delhi, you know, the entire political geography of India is, 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 is full of, populated by outfits, they call them as political parties, but they are either a pocket organization or a family organization. And some, some pocket organizations of individuals are in the making to become a family organizations. I don't have to name all of them, but you know, you know, you know what kind of a thing. So this is what I feel. And I feel that a lot of work remains to be done in the civil society sphere. Uh, that's why I keep writing and speaking. 
So, Prabhakar, uh, of course, I mean, I completely relate to this uh, entire thing about the family, uh, you know, being in politics and you obviously naturally, as you said, it becomes an outcome of you as a human being, you know, I, I get that because my father was uh, very CPIM and uh, left oriented and I saw that in my family when I was growing up and very subconsciously you start believing in uh, the entire theory that they want to take forward, which at, at a certain level, the concept actually doesn't work. What they they would like to believe is uh, the left ideology. My podcast is not really a political podcast, but Prabhakar, I'd really like people to know uh, you for the book that I saw you speak also in, uh, you know, at the Gasoli Literature Festival. And um, what stays back with me is this, that you're a prolific writer and a speaker, you know, and obviously uh, you've had such... um, prestigious institutes you've been with. So tell us a little bit about uh, the JNU uh, that uh, you were uh, in during that time. Uh, I'm from Delhi and I have been into JNU and then it was such a change in JNU that I also saw because SFI used to be the major party, you know, that uh, the Students uh, Union Party in Delhi, in uh, JNU, it, it had a very different environment all around there. What was it like during your time? Mohua, um, I went to JNU in 1978. I was at that time uh, at a very impressionable age. I just completed my graduation from Andhra Lalo College uh, in 78, 75, 78 my, was my graduation. Then I went for my MA to JNU. That was the first ever time I probably went out of my state. It's um, overwhelming. And, you know, I, JNU those days uh, was a small campus. And everyone knew every other person in the campus. The hostels and the way we socialized. Uh, we met uh, people. And uh, the long hours of discussion over a cup of tea, and, you know, sharing cigarettes, sharing tea, sharing... Uh, many things and uh, um, people, you know, groups sitting in the in the lawns and, you know, late into the night, uh, some group sings Assami songs, some other group sings Rokhinda Shongi, some other group sings, you know, Telugu songs, or Tamil songs or Kashmiri songs, you know, that kind of a very, very alive campus it was. And uh, the classroom atmosphere was uh, very informal. Um, you know, I I was used to, you know, my, my graduation, my, my college was uh, not a co-ed college. My school was also a boys' school. Of course, my high school, my primary school, you know, we had uh, girls and boys, but that was, uh, you know, when we were very little children. The first time as an adult, as a young person, when I sat in the class in January, my first day, um, you know, we were all sitting anywhere. I mean, there is, there is, there is no rule that, you know, the girls have to sit on one side and the boys, all the boys sat on the other side. It's not that, you know. Um, you have uh, on a bench, you know, uh, three people out of them. One is uh, a boy and two are girls or one girl and two boys. You know, that kind of a mixed kind of a thing. That itself was uh, uh, a very interesting and uh, very shocking to me. Uh, some of our teachers, believe you me, they were lecturing and they were also smoking while lecturing. And some other teachers, uh, professors, who didn't smoke, probably, you know, uh, uh, carry a, a cup of coffee with them. And some students also sat um, in the classroom with uh, a cup of coffee, a glass of coffee or a tea. And some would even light cigarettes when the, when the lecture was on. I mean... How would, would you be able to, you know, even, uh, um, even um, uh, imagine this at all? Coming from, uh, you know, uh, a Jesuit run college, that was the kind of a, a culture shock. 
And what I, what impressed me a lot about uh, JNU was, um, you know, there was absolutely no ragging. And uh, there was uh, no eve teasing. No, no girl felt unsafe in the campus 24 hours. You know, I have seen uh, girls or girls and boys walking on the roads of the, you know, uh, up campus um, around midnight, after midnight. And they could do that without fear of, uh, you know, somebody uh, accosting them or somebody assaulting them. Absolutely nothing. It was unthinkable. That's shocking. Uh, surprising. And then uh, um, you had uh, uh, discussions after discussions, debates after debates. In the classroom, you know, there was hardly any difference between a classroom and uh, the lawns in which we used to sit and the dining hall uh, where we had our food. They, they were all, it's a continuum. Mohua, believe it. It, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, it's not that, you know, you went to the class, you went to the university and it's over and you come back to a different world. No, that's what happens in, in most of the educational institutions, isn't it? That you go to a school and after the school, it's over. But, you know, uh, your room, your lawn, your dining hall, your library and the uh, little small canteen outside the library and your classroom. They all, you know, were one into the other. They seeped into the one into the other. Um, what what we what we spoke in the class, you know, we continued with it in the lawn. We continued with it uh, in the library outside the library, and then also in the rooms, and also in the dining uh, in the dining hall. That, that that's the kind of. Uh, that's way, and you know, and from 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 JNU, I went to the London School of Economics. Uh, let me say this: I think I'm I'm, I'm saying this uh, for the first time in in public to be on to be on record. You know, in in LSE, uh, the campus had three bars. <laughs> uh, you know. One bar was run by a, a private uh, party, a private proprietor, rights bar. The other one was run by the school itself. The, the LSE management. Used to wow. run. <laughs> Third one was run by the students' union. And when I went to LSE, of course, you know, that's also a very debating kind of a very discussion-oriented school. And we used to have an the old theater. We used to have uh, uh, general body meetings. We used to have a lot of people coming from different parts of the world, from different countries in Asia, different countries in Africa, different countries in uh, in uh, Latin America, South America, of course, the United States and Europe, you know, uh, academics and, and, and political leaders and people who are leading movements for national liberation or, you know, championing a particular cause. They all used to come and every day, some lecture or the other, some debate or the other. It's, it's so live uh, and not necessarily, you know, um, not necessarily uh, a sloganeering kind of a thing, no, very, very serious ones. Um, related to finance, related to investments, of course, also related to human rights. You know, those days, the the uh, biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, concerns for the world and people like us then, you know, was uh, the apartheid in South Africa. And LSE did have people uh, in in the student community, as well as people who came to lecture, who were you know, in support of the South African regime and who were opposed to that. 
Mm. That kind of a thing. And uh, we used to have, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 campaigns and calls to uh, protest against uh, banks and, you know, other uh, business establishments which are operating in uh, South Africa. We, operating in South Africa means that they were in support of the apartheid regime. You know, uh, trying to, um, you know, uh, confront them, question them, probably shame them. You know, I'll tell you, uh, I, I'm sure your, your audience would uh, uh, find this interesting. Um, um, you know, uh, South Africa also produces uh, good oranges, like Israel. And, you know, Israel, in, I mean, we were opposed to Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands and all that, you know, there's a lot of student community. And of course, uh, South Africa, because it's apartheid. So we used to go to a supermarket, you know, along with many other things, also buy either Israeli uh, oranges or South Af oranges from South Africa, come to the uh, uh, checkout counter, and there will be a lot of big queue, and when you come, you take out one of the other and uh, the girl or the boy, you know, they, they, in the till, they, uh, they bill you. And then the last item would be oranges, say from South Africa or some product from South Africa. Then uh, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a technique to, to, to cause a lot of inconvenience to the retail outlets which are bringing products from South Africa and selling. Ah, uh, we used to say, oh, wait, 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 wait. Is this where is this from? The girl would say, "Look at it," and the boy would say, "This is South Africa." No, I don't want South African products. Please take it out. You know, it's it's so difficult after billing the entire thing to take this out and make a fresh bill, and and a lot of twenty or thirty people who are waiting behind behind you. You know, they all become restless, and you know, if this happens every day, at every counter, many number of times, then. You know, there will be some kind of indirect pressure on that particular supermarket not to bring goods from either South Africa or Israel. This, this kind of a thing. And, you know, you go to a bank which does business in South Africa and open it in the, open an account in the morning. And afternoon, you go back to the uh, branch and say, look, I came to know that you're still doing business in South Africa. I would, I would like to withdraw my uh, uh, account. I would, I would like to close my account. You know, you, you do the, these kind of things. It's some kind of a satyagraha kind of a thing. You know, these are the things that, you know, uh, kept us uh, alive to what is happening in the world. Ah, one more thing. I, I told you about the bars. Um, you know, uh, our teachers at LSE, because we were senior students, we, I went there for PhD. We used to have a, a weekly seminar. We used to present our ideas and our work. Uh, and it's a one, one, one and a half hour uh, session. After one and a half hours, just before five to ten minutes before, you know, the next uh, 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 session for the other uh, batch, they used to, you know, come and uh, assemble outside the room. So the teacher would say, you know, uh, the next uh, people who have booked the room are already here and we have not completed our uh, discussion. So let's shift to the bar. So the entire group, along with our professor, we all used to shift to the bar sit in the bar and the convention was that the professor would get up and ask each one of us what did we want and then he would go and buy the first drink. You know, that, that kind of a informal, non-hierarchical, open, democratic, uh, you know, very aware of what's happening in the world. That is the kind of... Uh, uh, atmosphere, luckily for me, in both the institutions, one, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, the other, London School of, Law, London School of Economics in, in, in London. I agree with you on that fully, actually, because I um, I used to go a lot into JNU. I had joined the School of Languages and then I quit after a bit. Um, oh, which language? <laughs> I learned German. I actually oh. had gone through two or three centers and then I joined and then I realized that this is not uh, what I want to do and I prefer reading and writing in English than German. And uh, of course, and that during that, uh, I think that, you know, one and a half years that I was there, I've had a huge influence from JNU because I did a bit of theater with Sadr Hashmi and that's how I also know uh, Shabnam. And, uh, you know, there used to be every day some sort of cultural, uh, you know, 
conversation and people used to sit in Ganga Dhaba and I stayed very close also in, you know, to JNU. Um, remember, remember Moha, the Speak Mackie? Like the yes, of, of absolutely. Music. Yes. Absolutely. Most prominent musicians in JNU. Yes. Indian classical, both, you know, Karnatic as well as Hindustani. I have to interrupt, Prabhakar, because you take me back to a, you know, to a memory that is so deeply etched in my heart when I sat in this little room and there was uh, Bhimshan Joshi and he was singing uh, for the Spik Mackey and I was so embarrassed because I had tears flowing down my eyes and you know, you're very young, you don't know how to articulate as to how moved you are with that. And it was very embarrassing for me because, you know, my friends kind of next to me didn't understand as to why I was crying. But then to have somebody of his stature, I think, was uh, unbelievable. Then Janu also had, uh, you know, it's so interesting when I'm talking to Janu, also had the little, uh, you know, amphitheater and they had Zakir Hussain there and the entire sound would reverberate through the entire, uh, it was called Majnu Katila, you know, near that uh, hill. Uh, in Jenny. So I'm walking actually with you, you know, inside Delhi and inside that campus and I, I completely understand. But of course, I also realize that across India, one cannot have uh, yet uh, these sort of open universities because, you know, just recently there was such a crazy incident in uh, BHU and uh, that really left me so devastated as to, um, you know, how unsafe we are even now in spite of so much of progress that we've made. But, uh, I, you know, Prabhakar, I also need to ask you about you being a social commentator. You know, what advice would you give to the younger generation? You know, because a whole lot of people today want to do a lot of talk shows. They want to become commentators. They want to uh, pursue, uh, you know, a, a, a career in which they need to talk. They need to make uh, their own brands because today's media has completely changed, you know, uh, from before. So what advice would you give them, uh, Prabhakar? Um uh, Mohan, normally I don't give advice. Okay. <laughs> Since you've asked me and we are here, um, what I would uh, say is, that I, w- I won't say this in the form of an advice, but if I were, uh, say, in my 20s now today, or 30s or 40s, what would I do? Let, let, me, let me think aloud on that. Probably if, you know, there, there's something useful in that, probably somebody can pick it up. Um, you know, um, the first thing that I would want to be is essentially a Democrat. I want to speak, speak my mind out. And I should be able to live in a society where I can speak my mind and speak my mind out boldly without, you know, uh, having to fear what could be the consequences, repercussions. Would I be, you know, safe to say this? You know, if that is the cardinal principle, that's the core principle, what follows as a consequence is that I should also respect your right to speak, whatever you speak. That's the second one. And, you know, when you have these two, that means the I, I want a society which respects this kind of an atmosphere, different thoughts, tolerant society, which, which uh, respects diversity, which respects, you know, liberal-mindedness. Um which uh, doesn't cancel, you know, this cancel culture of, you know, oh, that opinion, no, this opinion, no, it's not that. Uh, you know, this is the kind of things that I want to see. And whatever I want to do in, in terms of my intervention in the in the public discourse, in, in social commentary, in political commentary, I write something about economy. The, at the core of it, this is the value. Um, and it extends to, you know, uh, tolerance of uh, your, your caste diversities, religious diversities, linguistic diversities, regional diversities. And of course, if you extend that to beyond your borders, uh, national diversities. Because, you know, I, ha- I, had, I had been to 
places where in one campus, in one classroom, um, I could see the microcosm of the world. That was it at LSE. And in, in India, I had seen in my classroom a microcosm of India in JNU and a microcosm of the world in LSE. You know, I had I had uh, in my class, you know, students from uh, Southern America, Africa, you know, North Africa, Europe, you know, Northern Europe, America, uh, Southeast Asia, China, Russia, in in, in LSE, and in Indi- in India in JNU, I had people from you know Kashmir and you know Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, everywhere, Assam. Bengal, Assam, Gujarat, you know, Tamil Nadu, other places, everywhere. You know, I, I, you, if, if you walk on uh, JNU campus or, you know, in LAC campus, there in JNU campus, you, you would find the entire India represented in some way or the other. On LAC, you, you see that the entire world is represented, you know, a sample of, you know, it's, it's a microcosm of the world there and a microcosm of India here. And, you know, that gives you a sense of, um, you know, respect to different cultures, different cuisines, different, you know, ways of dressing, different ways of talking, different ways of, different conventions, different, uh, you know, beliefs, uh, different political ideologies. Uh, The world is not a uniform world. India is not a uniform society. I think... If that consciousness is there in us as, as a basic tenet, as a basic uh, value, and you know, to advance that kind of an understanding, that would be my core. Uh, I, I would like to you know uh, pursue this kind of a line, and you know, if, if somebody feels that there is an advice in this. Then so, Prabhakar, I think a lot of Indians would want to pursue this core because this is something that we all stand by. And we believe that uh, India has got different cultures in different, different uh, states. And the beauty is actually about acceptance, learning and opening your mind because the mind has this absolutely vast capability of, uh, you know, being like a sponge and, you know, and how they really come in your life in different ways. It's unbelievable because it it unfolds in beautiful ways, you know, uh, as you grow older. So I completely agree with you on this. But I have to now ask you a little bit about your book and what should they expect from the book Crooked Timber of New India? Mohua, I, I wrote this. Uh, some of uh, the essays in that, I mean, it's subtitled as essays, on a Republican crisis. Some of the essays were written earlier. Some of the earlier essays were written especially for this book. You know, this has grown out of my discomfort with what's happening today, which is in contradiction to what I've just said about my 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 core uh, idea. Uh, you know, my uh, my creed, so to speak. I feel that you know, India is drifting away from these basic principles which were the constitutional principles, which informed our long national movement uh, for freedom and, uh, you know, uh, to to get out of the uh, colonial domination. The entire uh, period of that and the making of the constitution and, you know, decades after that, there were, there were a lot of ideas. But uh, these were the core principles. I feel that these core principles are under threat today. So I wanted to bring them all together, write and voice my concern. And I feel that, you know, the, 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 the country needs to be uh, cautioned about this, told about this, uh, warned about this. Amahua, um, the thing is this, I'm not expecting this book to, you know, change the world or to change the country. Uh, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, that kind of a 
uh, you know, uh, person who would overrate, you know, uh, his or her influence or whatever. But what is heartening is that, you know, at, in many places, it sparked a debate, a discussion. And I have got mails and messages and, you know, in wherever there were book events happened, people come to me and said that, you know, they read the book. Um, and then they liked it. And then some people would come to me and say that they read the book and they disagreed with it. Or disagreed with parts. But, you know, I am happy that people are talking about it. It, it ignited some kind of a discussion and a debate. The, and and that, that's the modest uh, objective that I had in mind when I wrote the book. Congratulations. Uh, I mean, I heard you speak at Kasoli and I said, you know, that I have to come back and pursue you, which I did, uh, to bring you for my podcast. So uh, before we end this podcast, uh, Prabhakar, it'd be lovely to know what do you envision for your, uh, you know, for your work, uh, you know, as an author, as a commentator, and the future, you know, of uh, Indian politics and socio-economic development, uh, the area that has been your area of expertise. Huh. Uh, we are uh, going through a tough time, Moa. Uh, but I, I also see a lot of uh, uh, rethinking in the civil society because I've, I've been traveling for the last one year or so. I've been traveling very extensively. Um, I've uh, uh, come back from uh, Kerala after uh, you know, visiting about three or four uh, towns. Then I'll be going back, going to Nagpur shortly. I, I'm, I've been traveling, talking about my book, and also addressing colleges and you know, students and schools and higher secondary schools and things like that. Mm, uh, what do I see? I see that you know uh, a lot of people are worried about what's happening now, they want to set it right. That's one. Um, they, 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 I also see uh, a lot of people concerned and asking very fundamental questions about our, uh, our uh, polity, the way our republic is structured, the way our electoral system is functioning. The way our different institutions are now, you know, uh, uh, either free or unfree, you know, the thrall of government or independent, you know, all these things are, people are asking questions. I want uh, a huge change to be brought about, very fundamental change in the way we constructed our republic in the way we run our government. You see, it is, and, and the way the democratic system functions in our uh, country. I want a, a basic change. And I think there are people now ready and receptive to these kind of ideas. When I say that to young people, especially in the colleges and schools, when I say, look, Democracy is not just going to a polling booth once in five years. Democracy is not the best form of government, but any other form of government is worse than democracy. And democracy means a government by discussion, passing of laws by discussion, repealing of laws by discussion, understanding each other, Respect to minority opinion. You know, th this is democracy. And, you know, people, young people are receptive to this. Receptive to this because they feel that that's not what we see today. Democracy today is reduced to a once-in-five-year exercise that you just go, you know, vote and somebody gets elected, some party gets elected. And after that, you know, you, 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 are, you are not even given a chance to ask questions. Forget about civil society, even parliament, even legislative assemblies, their members are not given a chance to ask questions. You know, this is the kind of a thing. So I want to see a fundamental change 
the way we conduct our elections, the way we conduct our legislation, the way we make laws, the way we we make our institutions function, etc. This is what I see. So thank you so much, Prakar, for being on today's episode, and for all our listeners here, uh, this was Parakala Prabhakar, and uh, you've heard him. And this book, his book, uh, Crooked Timber of New India, is a book that you will thoroughly enjoy. And uh, thank you so much once again for being on today's episode. Thank you, Mumbai. Thank you very much. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services: Spotify, Amazon Music. Apple Podcast and of course on all other major streaming services with loads of love we are the mohua show where we talk imandari se <laughs>